saying uh, welcome to Black Belt Interviews. This is Master David Hodson. I'm delighted uh, to be joined today by Grandmaster Mel Steiner from Miami, US. Welcome, sir. Good afternoon to you. It's uh, morning for me. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We're we're rather cold. Um, it's quite bright, but it's rather chilly now. Um, how's it in Miami? Well, uh, interestingly enough for us, uh, we're wearing uh, sweaters because it's all the way down to uh, uh, 60. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. For, for, for us, for us, it's, uh, that, that's cold, you know. No, I understand, sir. I have visited. It was only for a week um, back in February uh, before the COVID. Uh, had a wonderful time. Temperature was great. Um, so, yeah, I can understand what you're saying. Um, we're, we're used to chilly weather here in England. <laughs> well, I've been I've been a few times uh, out out your way. Okay, so I'm, I'm familiar with the weather. I've been there in February, so I I I, I know how uh, foolish. <laughs> it can be. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> that's it, sir. That's us. Um, but uh, so so grateful to have you here. Uh, we tried to fix up a little while ago. I know there's a couple of things that happened, so it's it's great to connect with you, sir. I'm really looking forward to the time we got to, to speak and hear all about your uh, Taekwondo experience and journey. Um, because <clears throat> I did check, sir, when, when things began for you, and uh, it was a little while ago, I guess. Uh, yep, I was. Uh, it's kind of an interesting story. I'm, I'm thinking, I, I don't know. Um, I was assaulted in uh, uh, the summer of 1969. Okay. Uh, it was uh, there was uh, we were walking down the street, minding our own business. And uh, there was uh, three boys, three lads and uh, one 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 girl. And then we, we were surrounded. And then next thing there were fists and feet and uh, bottles flying. Wow. Uh, and that kind of sort of encouraged me that uh, perhaps I needed something to defend myself. So coincidentally, I was starting. Uh, University of Miami in Florida uh, a few months after that. And um, I was living in the dorms, and the dorms consist of uh, rooms that are ringed. Uh, the perimeters are, are the rooms, but the interior are the communal bathrooms or so. So uh, I was walking to, towards one of the showers, and uh, some guy in uh, pajamas uh, jumped out of one of the side rooms and he's flailing away and screaming and yelling and uh, making all kinds of noises. Okay. And it kind of took me aback. I really wasn't quite, quite sure what that was all about. So then I went to knock on his door. He was sitting on the floor meditating in a, in a karate gi. And uh, so I, I asked him, so like, what, what, what's that? Oh, screaming and yelling and flailing. What, what is that all about? <laughs> Hey, Tommy, oh, uh, my psychiatrist seems to think that uh, uh, I have a bad temper and I, I need to take some kind of an activity that is uh, going to mellow me down. And so uh, he said, you know, coincidentally, I, I, I just got my ass kicked. I think it'd be a good thing if uh, maybe I looked into it. So he recommended a school and I basically never looked back from there. You know, oh. that's, that's my beginning story. Yeah, yeah. Wow, how, how interesting, because obviously, like you said, you, you faced that physical adversity, uh, but the opportunity came from that to, to, to be aware of someone actually practicing a martial art and, and you made that connection. And that, that led you to your first school, sir, yeah? Um, I, I kind of bounced around from uh, different arts because at, at the time, not like it is today, uh, to find pretty much anything. You either had to use uh, something called the Yellow Pages, which is, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, you don't find them anymore today. Um, and so most of these schools were not listed in, in any kind of a directory. So uh, by word of mouth, I, I was recommended uh, to, uh, to, into this one school and, and it, was, it was old school. There were no children, no women allowed in the training. Yeah. And the training was brutal. I mean, it was really physical. They they really they uh, they, they they really beat you and uh, uh, try to toughen you up from the very beginning. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
And was that led by a Korean, sir, or, or an American, or? Uh, it was an American, interestingly enough. Uh, he was teaching uh, Nisi Goju, second generation Goju. Um, I liked the principal. He, he was just a, a little bit erratic. And uh, I had to laugh because something like 40 something years later, uh, he mean like he, he, he had had uh, drug issues. And so he went to some kind of a drug rehab and they created he created a drug rehab program. He ended up selling it for millions of dollars and wow. and retired. And yeah. so I had I had an event in my school because uh, I still kept in touch. I still keep in touch with pretty much all the arts. And so they needed a facility for either a testing and uh, some kind of a meeting. And so he, and he comes in. Of course, he didn't remember me. It had been too many years, you know, too many years. Yeah, uh, yeah. Past. But uh, I had an opportunity to thank him um, for at least uh, teaching me the physical physical aspect because the other teachers that followed, they taught me other things, either the business side of it or other yeah. things, what other things may be, you know. Yeah, yeah. So was it, when were you officially doing Taekwondo? Uh, these were Taekwondo schools or they were? The, the uh, Taekwondo schools were few and far between. Um, there were, <laughs> there, there were maybe one or two non-Asians that were teaching something else. Chinese Kenpo or Goju, let's say, but uh, Taekwondo that I remember back in the day were being run by by uh, Korean instructors, and um, I had this notion because um, that was around like the Bruce Lee era and uh, and uh, other things were going on. I had this notion that if if I wanted to get the answer uh, in quotation marks, the answer, the way, yes, sir. that the the only way was through 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 an asian individual uh of course how wrong how wrong i was but at the time i didn't know yeah so i found um, a gentleman uh uh park kyun suk he was a fifth dan uh itf fifth dan and that was that was the beginning of my um taekwondo career but again uh, as far as books were concerned Nobody knew that the books were around. Yeah. So it was the do as I say method of, of, of learning. Uh, he carried around a little stick, a little bamboo whip. Okay. And his <clears throat> English English was not great, but you 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 understood fairly fa fast uh, if you were moving the wrong way when you got whacked someplace. Right. That oh maybe that's not the right way you know. <laughs> And so um, I see, I was thinking the other day, too, that even his certificates, even though he was ITF, his certificates, I think at the day, I don't know, Grandmaster Vitaly would know. Uh, yes. I think the certificates were different then. They were like a greenish. They were they were a little smaller. OK, so he uh, he was a uh, he was a fifth in at the time. And yeah. then um, uh, eventually I was getting ready for black belt. And he decided that uh, he wanted to open a restaurant instead. Okay. So he sold he sold the school, and the the stories were that the guy that bought the school, his son was some kind of a European uh, Taekwondo champion. So I didn't think too much about it until, like the patterns, I didn't I didn't quite you know see the similarities. We were doing the uh, Chanji Tangun Dosan patterns, and then they were doing the Palge Teguks. Uh, okay. Right, so right. So eventually I kind of caught on that um, the Taekwondo that he, was, that he was teaching was, I mean, it's called Olympic style now, but it was the WTF style then. Yeah. Uh, basically, um, this uh, Grand Master Ch uh, Choi uh decided that he would use as punching uh punching bags so i you know so that his son could continue his 
uh, world uh, domination. So, you know, that again uh, lasted for a while as much as I could take it. Not to mention he said, okay, uh, yeah, you, you're you ready for black belt, but you have to learn all the pagek, all the teguk patterns, and uh, you have to fight differently. You, you have to do things, you know, in, in a different way. Um, so again, my, my, my journey continued and I found out about a master, um, uh, so say Cho. And, um, I dropped in, in the school and there they are doing Chanji Tangun Dosan patterns. Okay. And so I, so I stayed, I stayed with him after that. Um, okay. of course, eventually I found out he made a mistake. I would come early to train. He made a mistake, and uh, he left one of the condensed encyclopedias on his desk. Uh, so I started rummaging through there. Of course, he caught me, and that was an automatic 50 push-ups and uh, <laughs> like that, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then the the the, the seed was already planted that uh, some of the things that he was teaching were not according to, to the book. Right. And so I, I I tried to some way to ask him to where he wasn't going to pun punish me, and so I would usually say, "You're teaching, me, telling me, but the book be different." And of course, the answer was, "Well, you know, book wrong. You 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 follow me." Yeah, yeah, yeah. And eventually, eventually, of course, like I said, the the seed was already planted. That here we have a book of some kind of a manual that contradicts some of the stuff that he was teaching. Not to mention he had left out a whole bunch of stuff. Two step sparring. Nobody heard two step sparring uh, as far as the names of the of the kicks. For uh, he didn't delineate the different the differences in the kicks where there were uh, side front side turning. You know, like that. It, the, none of that stuff existed. Right, right. And and forget the stances. You know, there were there was no you know, correcting uh, lengths, uh, width, distance, nothing. So, uh, you know, that lasted for a little while. But, you know, again, they, uh, I had a falling out with uh, me. Eventually, uh, I heard a rumor that General Che was alive. Okay, I was going to say, yeah. There might have been maybe the early 80s, 1980s, that I had heard, heard that, he that he what might have been alive and I was like flabbergasted. So uh, somehow I found the name of his daughter because his daughter at the time was the secretary of the ITF. Okay. So I wrote I wrote to her and uh, uh, you know inquiring like who's who's in the USA representing uh, General Che. And they said, well, there's this six Dan. Uh, Charles Seraph out of uh, Denver, Colorado. Yes, yes. <clears throat> at the time, at the time it was a fourth end. So uh, I thought, okay. So I, I called them up and they said, well, you know, we have black belt classes every Friday. Uh, well, that's great, but you know, I'm in Miami. <laughs> 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 um, so I bit the bullet. I said, okay, I made an appointment. And uh, I flew out to Denver in the, in the winter, January, February. They were, I don't know how many feet of snow. I came right. from Palm Tree and, and 80 degrees. Yes, yes. Uh, so when uh, I came out of the airport, I, I thought nothing. I just, I grabbed a taxi and I told them, take me to Broomfield, Colorado. And he yes. said, you know, it, it's, quite, it's quite a ride from Denver Airport. Is it? I said, yeah. I, I don't care. Okay. So, so I, I showed up. It was, it was, it was night, nighttime. Uh, classes were going on. Uh, Mr. Seraph uh, received me and then said, well, what are you doing here? And I said, <laughs> well, you guys invite me? He said, no, no, no. We mean is, you know, we sent somebody to go pick you up. Uh, one of our black students went to, you know, you're a senior. We 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 uh, wanted to pick you up. I said, "Well, I, I just missed out." <laughs> so then when, when I what you haven't been you haven't been to Grandmaster Sarah's school by any chance, have you? Not yet. So we actually booked to go 
but it became the COVID year, so we had to cancel. Um, we we all had plans to go actually, so sadly not yet. Ah, okay, okay. Well, only just that the way that he had his uh, school set up, he had um, the the floor had like a like a wall like a wall around it, uh, so that you could stand outside of the wall okay. and see and still see the floor. And and so then I was standing there. And I started counting how many black belts were on the floor, and again I was uh, I was amazed because I I had never seen any Korean no. with more two three black belts, never mind four damn black belts, and so there were three other black belts, four other black belts other than me, that uh, that 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 were there, so Grandmaster Sarah came out, came over and said, uh, "We'll take the class." Yes, sir. So uh, I got dressed up. Again, uh, time zone. It's a mile up. <laughs> it's yeah, cold. Yeah. You know, it's cold. It's it's. Uh, and, and I'm thinking, you know, I'm in. I'm in a new class. I'm probably gonna get my ass beat. I'm thinking by somebody I I I, I don't know. And kind of sen- semi sure, sure enough, you know, uh, Grandmaster Sarah was trying to feel us out because at the time there were only four three or four other four damn black belts in the ITF in the USA. That's it. Wow. You know? Yeah. So here I am in, you know, uh, I didn't know. Uh, what, what, what do I know? And so he put, uh, he put a young gun, I guess, to, to, to see if I was just some guy that made up his rank or, or whatever the case may yeah. be. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, first kick, I got kicked in the head and then knocked my glasses off. Okay. So I, I I kind of understood. Okay, I know where that's coming from. Yeah. And so then, from then on, I stepped I stepped it up, and uh, you know I took care of the of the second end. And you know, meanwhile, I, I saw the grandmaster Sarah. He was kind of watching and and smiling a little bit, trying to see uh, what 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 was that what yeah. what was going on. Um, sometime later. There was a summer camp in in Colorado. Uh, USCF was famous for having yeah. uh, f- fabulous summer camps up in the mountains. Um, and so he assigned his most senior student, Grandmaster Walt Lang, to review me. So okay. at the time, it was, uh, I believe Grandmaster Weininger was his first, and then Grandmaster Lang second, something like that, or, or yeah. vice versa, as far as uh, ranking there were four dance yeah and so master so grandmaster uh serve told grandmaster lang i want you to review this guy everything all the kicks all the punches all, all the self defenses everything so we spent pretty much eight hours without okay. stopping him you know ran me through everything um and then nothing was said i figured well okay i'm 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 in trouble <laughs> and so then I kind of stopped and tried to find out there was a uh, there was a bonfire that evening, and uh, so I went up to Grandmaster Serif and I said, you know, I, I'd like to know what you would like for me to do. If you want me to start over as a first stand, it's fine with me. I don't have a problem with that. If you think that uh, um, I should be uh, the rank that I'm not I now have I now have fourth stand, I would understand. Yeah. And of course, you know, he asked me everything, who I trained under, what the exams consisted of, uh, uh, who was there, uh, all kinds of information, you know. Yeah. And then, then eventually it kind of dawned on me that the testing board uh, that I had presented uh, my skills to was a combination of ITF and WTF. Korean black belts. Okay. And they weren't assigned. They were not assigning ITF certificates. Of course, at the time, none of us were, were kind of given the impression that the ITF certificate a was around or worth anything. Yeah. Uh, Mostly, mostly, you know, they, they impressed upon us uh, their own certification, of course. And uh, so Upon reflection, I realized, well, 
they could have very easily said, your testing board was not made up of ITF, all ITF instructors. Uh, not to mention, they never gave you an ITF certificate, you know. Yeah. So I, I was in a panic, but I was I was prepared. I, I didn't I didn't care. I didn't I didn't mind. Yeah. And uh, you know, sure enough, um, uh, in 1985, I found out that uh, General Che was going to come to Texas. Okay. So I flew I flew out to Texas in '85. And that was like the first time that I saw something called spring style. And uh, I remember uh, Grandmaster Weiniger. Well, he was a master then, fourth then. Yeah. I was sitting next to him, and I'm watching them. And, you know, they're, boun they're bouncing, bouncing up and down, up and down, doing the sound. But then the pausing and the undulation was 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 quite different, of course, you know. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. Uh, Grandmaster Weiniger at the time had spent a week with the general at his house, uh, training and running through all the pages in the encyclopedia. So I figured, well, you know who, you know who better. And uh, there was a there was a dinner later on, and again I was still an outsider for all intents and purposes. Okay. So I wasn't quite sure. They had this huge U-shaped table. General Che was at the head. Grandmaster Serif was on the other. And then um, uh, Grandmaster Weiniger, Grandmaster uh, Wheatley, uh, Grandmaster Ser Mr. Serif, uh, Grandmaster Lang, they, they, were, they were all up there sitting there as fourth and seniors. So I wasn't quite sure where to sit. The next thing I see is, you know, Grandmaster Serif is, is, is signaling. So I came over. And then I wasn't quite sure, like, who to bow to. Yes. Yeah, sure. I had never, I had never met General Che. I had never seen. I mean, I've seen pictures of him. Yeah. But they're they're sitting next to each other, and 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 I struggled greatly as to the the, the as, as to the process because never had I seen two high ranking um, grandmasters all in the same place. You know, so fortunately or unfortunately, they were both sitting side by side. So I bowed to the two of them. Yeah. And, you know, meanwhile, Master Serv is talking to the general. Oh, this is the gentleman that I was speaking to you about. Okay. So I thought, oh, geez, geez, I hope that was, I, I hope that was a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> and and um, and then uh, General Che left. So uh, again, I went to Grandmaster Serv's room and and uh, inquired. So do I put a do I put a white belt on or a yeah. First degree belt. Well, what color belt? He said, "Let me tell you something. Uh, Grandmaster Lang is my most senior student. Uh, you cannot impress him. He's, you know, but oh, he spent all those hours with you. He was very impressed with what he saw. Oh. I recommended say that he recognize your your ranks up to fourth and." And then the ITF will then issue you issue you a fourth degree certificate uh, from Vienna. We're going to recommend that you take this instructor's course that's uh, coming around. And uh, so then I I looked around and at the time, the 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 courses were being given in Europe, and and even then there were very few, because the one that I took, which was number ten in 1988 was in Canada through Park chung -tae. and Park chung -tae at the time was the secretary general. And it was brutal. It was, you know, two weeks long. Yes. Not, not only did we go through all the steps, powering and all the kicks and all the patterns, but also uh, refereeing and, uh, you know, things, things like that. So um, that was my introduction Heavy duty introduction to every page of the encyclopedia, and of course I then bought anything and everything that I could that I could get my hands on. So uh, uh, that's that's my my short version uh, up to 1985. <laughs> wow, wow, sir! There's so much there, isn't there? I mean, you it was as if you was on a quest, somewhat from what you're saying to to find the answer you you, you were talking about. So um, when you went to uh, Denver, did you find, think at the time this is 
this is this is the answer. This is what I've been looking for. I recognize the people here. No, hundred percent. The uh, uh, the movements were, uh, you know, compared to uh, uh, Master pa Park Chang Te, um, there was lots of explanations. The movements were not like how they are today, but but yet they 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 seem to be uh, more according to the books. And not to mention, they also uh, you know. Uh, back at the time, they would have like an L stance. There was only one roundhouse kick. There was only one yes, front yeah. kick. There was one right. Yeah. And yeah. So here's here he's taking here here he's talking about. There's no horse stance. There's no cat stance. There's no you know uh, the old Japanese way of doing things. Uh, fixed stance, uh, L stance, walking stance, turning kick, side turning kick. Um, so it 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 opened my eyes in a very pleasant sort of way. Yeah. In, in two ways, a I came came a long way, but man, I didn't learn half the stuff that I was supposed to learn. You know. Yeah, 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 yeah. So from that that part, I was very, 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 very happy, and of course, it opened the door for me to to spend lots of time with Geno Che. I mean, a lot of time. Yeah. Uh, he came to my school in 1992. Wow. I had I had his home phone number, you know, uh, I, I would call him off and on and uh, I would laugh because his wife would usually answer the phone Yes, because he didn't, he didn't like to answer the phone. Okay. And I could, I could hear in the background, who, who that? And she would say, uh, Steiner from Miami. Uh, I talked to him. You okay. Know, the, <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. And, um, of course, I had uh, I had the the famous or infamous question about uh, Ju Che that uh, haunted me for quite 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 a few years, and uh, I think I got under General Che's skin there for a little while. But uh, at the end of the day, the "do as I say" came right out, and uh, that was the end of my uh, my quest as far as Ju Che. I don't know if you are. Uh, you know, familiar with uh, uh, the question that was that I asked about Juche or not? So, uh, no, sir. Maybe you could tell us that. Um, Juche came around uh, 1981 or so. Um, there was some issue about Kodang, and so. Mm -hmm. It is, they decided that they were not going to be teaching Kodang anymore. I mean, I later find out found out why the story was, but uh, okay. yeah. So you know, we 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 were taught we were taught Juche, and uh, in my mind, I was thinking, "Wow, this is really a hard pattern." Uh, I wonder why I wonder why they why why they switched Juche. Yeah. And so when when I when I started looking at the pattern diagram. Uh, I I I saw a glaring mistake, error, okay. something in my mind would be unthinkable for General Che to make. You know, there's mistakes in the in the books, you know, pictures and uh, some explanations. There's some minor, either typographical errors or just some, uh, not nothing extraordinary, you know. But this one was a real glaring, real glaring mistake and. There was a training for six dance at the time with only General Che, and uh, he had he had made nice nice with his son, and so it was his son and General Che and the six dance USA six dance. Well, five or six of us basically were in the room, uh, just alone with him. And as we're running through the patterns, we 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 get to Ju Che. Uh, there is a video in there. There, there are pictures, just okay. just in case. Yes, yes. Uh, he asked if there were any questions, and you know, I I said I I have a question, and he said, well, what is the question? I said uh, I don't believe that the the uh, that the way that the pattern is designed that we can do juche properly. And, and he said, well, what what you mean? And I said the pattern is going in the wrong direction, and uh, that that caused a real big buzz. 
Yeah, uh, yeah. So next thing, I'm standing standing now in front of General Che. Yeah, yeah. And I think I stood there maybe half an hour. He and his son are having a conversation in Korean, uh, back and forth. Yeah. Everybody else sitting on the floor writing notes and like, what the hell is it? What is he talking about? You know, I don't, I don't know what he's talking about. And so the son is now putting, he took a, a piece of paper and now he's writing a and putting a, uh, to where a goes B C D E F G H, you know, like, like that. Yeah. And, uh, next thing I know is a whispering going on and grandmaster serve makes an announcement. We're, we're taking a 20 minute break. Okay. Wow. And uh, we, we took a 20, 20 minute break. And so uh, Grandmaster Sarah comes up to me and he says uh, uh, something to the effect that I was being disrespectful. And so I was a little confused. I didn't know what he was talking about because yeah. I posed the question appropriately. It yeah. wasn't, you know, was not being disrespectful. Yeah. And he's, he said, no, just in general, um, uh, questions uh, should be proposed in a proper way. And I said, so you're only talking about me because I'm the only one that's created this issue, you know, with the pattern. I said, look, I I'm, I'm, this, this is what it is. I'm confused. It says that the pattern starts in AB, and then it wants us to go behind us, line EF. Historically, up until then, and even after that, Line EF has never been behind line AB. And yeah. here we come to Juche, and Juche is telling us that the line has now changed the other way. So they made a big announcement, uh, you know, about uh, asking improper questions. And so so I got a spanking. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> uh, so the, the, the seminar finished. Obviously, I never got an answer. Yeah, but I kept calling him. I kept calling him, and I kept <laughs> I kept writing him, and I kept thinking, why yeah. is why is this way? There's got to be. There must be some some reason. So uh, I started writing him uh, suggestions. Maybe we should line. We should add a line. Uh, I J. Uh, maybe we should do this. Maybe we should do. Maybe we should do that. Uh, and I, I never got an answer, of course. Sure. And so six months later, I was in, in uh, 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 Canada again, Newfoundland, Newfoundland. And uh, he flew in on a private plane. And I was the first one on the receiving line. And again, winter, it was cold. He had his coat on, his little yeah. hat on. And so he got off the phone, got off, uh, got off the plane. And, you know, I, I, I go to bow to him. Now, I hadn't seen him in six months. The first thing he says to me, forget Juche pattern. <laughs> yes, sir. <No> problem. <laughs> <laughs> that was the end of that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, the long, but the long story short, uh, when I became president of the ICTF, I had a meeting with all the seniors, and uh, I told them, that uh, we do have a precedence in our patterns where we have one pattern that does not start on line A, B. And so because of that, not to be disrespectful to General Che, but I am going to move the starting line up to GH. So that way when Ju Che starts on line GH and you go backwards, you know, in the, the trident U-shaped uh, direction, then you are now going towards EF and nothing else changes. You don't have to change anything. So that's uh, that's part of the Juche story there. Yeah, yeah, and that's very interesting. So, I mean, I have not heard of that that before, the diagram. I mean, now you say, it, it, I do understand what you're, you're, you're mentioning. How did the, uh, like the seniors, obviously, um, around you at the time it happened, were kind of saying how you should, we should ask, ask ask questions correctly or so on. But did anyone else become interested in what you you were saying? Did they pick up on that? Nobody nobody to this day understands that if you follow the written word, that pattern cannot be performed. Right. Period. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. So 
I don't know. I'm still, I'm still, I don't know. I'm still scratching my head. <laughs> it's, glaring, it's a glaring, it's a glaring mistake. Okay. So uh, something that the general would have not done by accident. Right. Right. Of course. Well, there may be someone else listening that will, will comment on that and, and give their opinion and we, we can uh, open the debate. <laughs> but as you say, it was a defining moment for you, I guess, uh, um, as you got to know General Che better. Um, you could ask certain questions of him, I guess, couldn't you? But some he would spent, uh, wouldn't you? Yeah, I spent quite a, quite a, a lot of a, lo a long time with him. Um, I took 12 seminars with him uh, directly. I've, everywhere, that, anytime he was anywhere in the neighborhood in the yeah. USA, I went. Of course, if as he's traveling farther away and he was uh, doing more instructor courses, I didn't feel the need to go, uh, you know, any farther than, let's say, Canada or uh, South America or, or, or like that, you know. Yeah, yeah. But sometimes also he would come through Miami on his way somewhere. Right. And so then they would, let, they, would, they would let me know at the last minute because at the time he was under, you know, he was under guard uh because um there were rumors that they were trying to assassinate him and so when he came to miami i had a meeting with the uh fbi federal B bureau of investigations uh yeah. uh in their headquarters and i asked if they could assign agents because i was afraid you know i was afraid for his life right and also w wherever i traveled I would find out what floor he was on, and yeah. I, I, I wouldn't stay on that floor. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, he he had to live a certain life, didn't he? Ha having been, having left Korea and uh, and so on, and like you said, the the difficulties with that. Um, but uh, you you obviously got to know him quite well. I I did see a picture recently of, of, of some calligraphy um, that I believe you were in possession of, of General Chase, is that correct, sir? Right, right, right. I built, uh, I built my own school and uh, coincidentally, the grand opening was on his lunar birthday, which was, which is November 9. His solar birthday is December 22nd. And so, uh, again, I, I hadn't thought too much about it. I picked up the phone and I asked, you know, sir, would, uh, can you teach a instructor seminar in my school? Um, I just finished building it or I'm just finished building it. Uh, has uh, oak floors. It's uh, 5,000 square feet. Has 55 feet of mirrors. It's 25 feet high. It has uh, skylights, uh, you know, it's brand new, brand new. Oh. Uh, would you mind, you know, would you mind? I fully expected that he would say no, you know, because he, he didn't say yes all the time. No, no. And he said, I, 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 I'll come. And then it wasn't not until after I realized not only did he, did he agree, but he agreed on his birthday. Wow. So, so, um, um, yeah, he came, uh, he came to visit and, uh, at the time he was writing, I believe the uh, those small manuals, memoirs. He was writing his memoirs. You know the small manuals that are number one, number two. And he was showing me he was writing on envelopes on the back of stationery. Yeah. And so he was busy. He was, busy, you know, he was busy writing his his memoirs, which was which was uh, interesting. I I thought. He mentions uh, coming to Miami, but not by name, uh, which I, I I thought was was nice of him. Yeah. And uh, so at, at the grand opening, you know, he had painted uh, a, a calligraphy. You know, he was famous for in his day for singing and also doing calligraphy. So uh, he gave me a personalized calligraphy. It says Taekwondo in Chinese, which again. The interesting thing is that that first book that uh, has surfaced from 1959 is in Chinese that he wrote 
uh, uh, some kind of an obscure uh, Chinese. And so his calligraphy was in Chinese anyways. Yeah. So the calligraphy, calligraphy says Taekwondo in the center. And then he wrote a thank you to me on, on, on the sides of the uh, calligraphy. And then he presented that to me in 1992 when, when I officially opened my school. And at, at the time, there were hundreds of black belts that had come from all over the world wow. to, to take this instructor instructor's course. Yeah, so yeah. that's how calligraphy came to be. Wow. Wonderful. Where, where is it now, sir? Is it? It's hanging. It, it's hanging in my house. Uh, yeah. We had we had a, a hurricane soon thereafter, um, which um, um, uh, even though the the building is made out of concrete, um, the school had four skylights, eight feet in diameter. The 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 winds blew the skylights. And then water came into school. Yeah, uh, I was in I was in Nicaragua at the time. I was meeting with the president of Nicaragua for uh, Taekwondo, and so mm, uh, my ex wife called me. She says, "You know, we're having a hurricane." I said, "Look, I'm in the middle of nowhere. I didn't even know we, that there was a, a hurricane in Florida." Yeah. She says, "Out of all the stuff that you have up in up on the walls, because all the walls were full of." certificates and awards and whatever it says out of everything that's up on the wall what do you want what do you treasure most i said take my itf plaque and take general Che's calligraphy yeah, and yeah. so he, she took those things off the walls and then those survived those survived the hurricane wow. so i have those hanging in my in my living room now <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah like you say priceless uh, what you what you have there um sadly hurricanes do happen in florida don't they it's something you 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 will live with and adjust to i guess when they happen but uh, they still catch buildings don't they so well we, we haven't had a hurricane in a sorry yeah, we haven't had a hurricane in a while but uh you know those people that are sitting Saying that uh, we're not having a uh, a warming global warming, I mean these these hurricanes are are, are reaching uh, just like typhoons. They're reaching category five and beyond. Yeah, yeah. That used to be really super, cool, you know, and, and today they're almost more commonplace. Yeah. So uh, so far, it's been a few years. At least in, in the Miami, in, in, as far as Miami, we haven't had a hurricane in a while. So that's not too bad. Plus, we, we get to see it coming. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so so your training is so, uh, has so much time and depth to it and, and experiences, you know, because when you look at the conception of Taekwondo and the, the pioneers, you're very much part of the second generation, I guess, that, that that have come through. Is that how you see yourself, sir? Is this after the pioneers? Yourself and uh, interestingly people. enough, interestingly enough, you know, when uh, when when General Che passed away, soon thereafter there was a meeting in California of uh, the pioneers. They they all came out of either retirement. Uh, or uh, some were still active, C.K. Choi, for example, and and they, they weren't quite sure exactly like what to do because uh, who's going to replace General Che? Nobody. So they they were thinking about uh, doing some, they, to create some kind of a pioneering council or uh, so, something along those lines. Uh, I, I got a call from uh, Grandmaster Kong Young Il. And he said, the pioneers are coming together. Would you like to fly out to California? Uh, we would like for you to be secretary general. Wow. And I said, uh, no, I don't, I, no, I don't think so. Uh, I don't, uh, you know, I don't speak Korean, first of all. And I don't, uh, I don't, I don't want to be secretary general. I know what the job entails. And, and so uh, uh, I, I think all that fell apart anyways. They they had a falling out amongst themselves, and then that 
that was pretty much kind of sort of the end of that. Yeah. But but out of that, everybody was after Grandmaster Nam Tehi to um, uh, be part of their their groups. By then, the ITF is split into three, and so the three were after Grandmaster Nam Tehi to put his seal on certificates and uh, you know as if to say, look, we 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 are the legitimate. Um, Chung Hon uh, system. He turned everybody down. Right. I I I found this out later, and um, Grandmaster Kong called me and he says, um, "I'm having a meeting in um, uh, Las Vegas. I'd like for you to come out." So I I came out, and now there there were uh, Grandmaster Cariati was there. There were uh, uh, some seniors were there. And uh, in and out were coming uh, different pioneers. They were they were having like sort of their own meetings. So uh, Grandmaster Kong said to him, "There's a special guest coming." Um, oh, that's great! We were sitting at a restaurant, and and next thing I I see this older gentleman with a cane getting out of a van. Um, I had not met Grandmaster Nantehi before. Wow. Right, because he'd been retired already, and uh, he was not in the public eye. And in my mind, I'm thinking, well, holy cow, that is that is Grandmaster Nantehi. Yeah, yeah, sure yeah. enough, sure enough, we had lunch with Grandmaster Nantehi, wow. and um, Grandmaster Kong leans over and he says, uh, "You know that um, uh, 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 other groups have wanted him to be president or just part of their organization." And yeah. I said, I, 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 I heard, I heard about that. And he said, well, uh, it's your job to convince him to come with us. <laughs> and I said, uh, wh what are you talking about? Uh, everyone who's ever talked to him said, no, yeah. uh, who, who am I? I am nobody. I, how am I going to go talk to him? You know, this gentleman who's a legend, if it wasn't for him, we wouldn't be around. And you're asking me <laughs> after he's turned everybody else down, to sit down and convince him. Yeah. So so I'm in a panic now because I, you know, so we went to Grandmaster Kong's office and uh, Grandmaster Nantehi is sitting uh, on the in, on the main chair and the, the, then Grandmaster Kong and I were sitting across from him and I'm just looking at Grandmaster Nantehi and I'm thinking, what, what am I going to, what am I going to say to him? You know, I mean, so I, I started talking to him about uh, his history and his contributions and the demonstration that he did in 1953 in front of uh, Sigmund Rhee. And the fact uh, that uh, because of that, General Che, you know, it kind of gave General Che some kind of uh, impetus and uh, on and on and on and on. And uh, that uh, the organization that uh, we were trying to put together was to be in keeping with General Che's teachings, number one, and more imp more importantly, is to keep his, your legacy, you, not Nam yeah. legacy, going forwards so that you would not be forgotten. He's crying now. Wow. I'm in a panic because he's crying. <laughs> he's crying, you know. <laughs> and uh, he said, and right there and then he said, uh, Yes, I, 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 I will, I will be part of, part right. of this group, and so he became uh, honorary president of the ICTF, International Chung Hon Taekwondo uh, Federation, and uh, you know that lasted, you know, a few years. Yeah, and, and uh, then eventually Kong went his own way, and Grandmaster Nam Tehi, of course, passed away. Um. But some, again, somewhere in between, that's why I was saying that in 2003, um, I was a seventh N, Grandmaster Nam asked me, so like, what what, what rank are you? I said, sir, I'm, I'm, I'm a seventh N. He said, no, you're an eighth N. I said, sir, I, I have four more years to go. No, sir. He says, yes, you you will be eighth N. He says, I, and I said, I will not accept, no. He said, you have no choice. <laughs> yes, sir, okay. And so he, he signed a certificate 
Kong yeah. Young-il signed 8 2003. And eventually I became president of the uh, ICTF for three, four years. And then I turned that over to Grandmaster Cariotti. And uh, here, here, here we are. Wow. Wow. So another, another amazing moment in, 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 in your life, but also the Taekwondo's pioneers and, and that, you know, that that's really something, isn't it? But you, know, you said you, you get, was given the job to persuade him and uh, where others are tried. Um, and, and you, you did it, you did it. And uh, like you say, Nam Tae Hee is very much in the forefront of Taekwondo in itself, isn't it? But right. Yeah. Sort of right at the beginning, right, the right, right next to General Che. Um, and there's some legendary stories of his ability and, and the way he used it in the military that we've read about. So you convinced him and, you, and, he, and he responded by for promoting you as well. I mean, that's, that's pretty special, sir. Isn't it? <laughs> well, you know, the, the stories that he had told that uh, he had uh, actually killed people with uh, Taekwondo during, you know, the, uh, the issues between the North Koreans and the Chinese. And I mean, he, he, he had some story, you know, and, uh, had he not done a breaking demonstration and, and self-defense and uh, uh, of course, I mean, at that time that what, what he was practicing was not, not Chang Hoon, uh, basically Chong Do Kwan, i.e. Shotokan. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, still he as an individual, uh, the fact that he was uh, lower ranking in the, in the armed forces and general Che was, high ranking in the armed forces. He had access to helicopters and jeeps and buses and cars and whatever. Uh, uh, General Che was lower ranking in the martial arts. Nam Te He was higher ranking in the in the martial arts. Yeah. And it was a fairly smart move for the two of them to come together because then General Che made the martial arts accessible to everybody. And then General Che, of course, then created the Odokwan uh, because the soldiers were practicing all different types of martial arts, uh, not only Chongokwan, but uh, either Chinese or, 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 or other, other systems. So he created the Odokwan, you know, the gym of my way. Yeah. And, uh, well, I'm sure that uh, Grandmaster uh, Vitalik gave you that whole story. He knows more dates and names and all that other stuff so yeah yeah you, cool. you're aware of uh, all, all of that stuff how it went down so yeah absolutely yeah yeah, yeah. very much but so back to your own training and and everything uh i understand you've you you have your method for conditioning and breaking and uh right. did you want to say a little bit about that sir um Yes, I, uh, as I had, uh, mentioned earlier, I've been in touch, still to this day, I'm in touch with different stylists, martial arts stylists. And uh, along the way, I had lent the school to uh, instructors that wanted to teach seminars of their own system. Uh, one of them was uh, Grandmaster Peter Urban. He created uh, USA Goju. Um uh, there was another gentleman too, uh, Grandmaster Chan Poi. Grandmaster Chan Poi has been on the cover of every Kung Fu magazine pretty much ever. He's a legend uh, in, in, in his own right. Uh, one of his students had, I had befriended one of his students at a tournament, and uh, she had come up to me and said, uh, uh, we'd like to have a seminar, but we can't seem to find a place. And I said, well, why don't you just use my school? She said, but, and again, in those days, it wasn't done where you you would have uh, uh, com not competing, but competing arts, uh, having any kinds of events together. Yeah, they were open tournaments, but basically, you know, you were fighting each other or whatever, but to come together to have some kind of a meeting of the minds 
it wasn't it wasn't normally done. And meanwhile, I had had other people who had been in the school, you know, and I thought uh, it, it's good for the students to learn and, of course, for us to learn and for them to also understand what our military system of Taekwondo is all about. And so I suggested to her, why don't you have the seminar in my school? And so I, I, I met Grandmaster uh, Chan, and he had mentioned, I'm going to uh, have the first ever trip to, uh, trip to China. How would you like to go? And I said, well, how, how long is the trip? She said, well, it's going to be three weeks. Three weeks. I said, man, okay. I had just, I had a three-year-old son at the time. Right, I right. said, three weeks, man. I, and then, okay, uh, I can, my black belts can uh, keep the school open. And so uh talked to my ex-wife and I said, uh, how would you like to go on a long trip? Where are we going? So uh, we're going to China. <laughs> we're going to China. So that's what we did. We uh, we we went to China. He took us everywhere. We went to the Shaolin Temple. We went to the Great Wall. Yeah, yeah. He was unbeknownst to us, he was being inducted as the thirty third disciple of the Shaolin Temple wow. uh, in Hunan Province. So uh, he took us around here, to everywhere. We got to see all all sorts of martial arts. Uh, we got to meet the, the heads of uh, so many different styles, Kung Fu styles that some unheard of even, even to this day. And uh, we were taking a, a train ride. I was aware that the Chinese had uh, two, two systems, internal and external. So they had the touch of death, Dim Mak, and uh, <clears throat> And then they also had the ex external, which was uh, the the iron palm. And so I, I had seen through the magazines and I had heard something about it, you know. So I had heard that he was teaching the external uh, iron palm. Yeah. And I met one of his senior students that was uh, practicing because they would choose uh, either the weapons or 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 the patterns according to you is kind of individualized so like if it was a heavy weapon it would be a bigger guy if it was a lighter weapon yeah. you know i mean they had hundreds of weapons, so it didn't it, it didn't matter and so we, we were taking a train somewhere i don't remember where and i'm talking to his uh student she's sitting next to me he's pretend sleeping on the other side of her and I somehow we got on the subject of uh, iron palm and and how I was interested in learning iron palm and whatever and again I had no chance in learning it because the Chinese way is you, you teach uh, your own students or your own family and that's 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 how it was so I figured well I mean I have nothing to lose at the end of the day and so from a deep sleep, he's mumbling, 108-day uh, training. And so I said, uh, uh, sir, I'm, uh, what do you mean 108 days training? He says, yes, it's 108-day training nonstop. And I said, I I can do 108 days training. And that, and that, and that was all. That, that was all I heard. Right. So we went through. I did some de taekwondo <clears throat> demonstration. I did some Taekwondo demonstration at the Shaolin Temple. We went to a uh, Kung Fu school that the state was running. Uh, we did uh, we did we did a lot of demonstrations. They hadn't seen Taekwondo before. Uh, very basic, very rudimentary compared to the Kung Fu that those guys were practicing. So, sure. and so again, we we fast forward. I'm back in the states. I get a call from the student. Uh, Grandmaster Chen is going to be three hours from you, he's going to teach a seminar for the weekend. Do you want to go? And uh, I said, no, I'm, 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 I'm going to, I'm going to be busy. And I, I hung up the phone. Then I started thinking, geez, I wonder if he asked, if he asked her to call me. So I called her back and I said, did Grandmaster Chan ask you to call me? He says, yeah, he asked for you. He says he, he wants to see you. I said, well, absolutely. I'm coming. You should have said that from the beginning. <laughs> So, 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 so I went 
and uh, he had a meeting with two of us. Uh, they might, maybe there were 20 or 30 students there practicing. His own students. I was the, the only outsider. And uh, he said, uh, I, I will teach you, I will teach you Iron Palm. So I was like, oh, okay. So he had me uh, come to his uh, uh, cabin at five o'clock in the morning. And I'm thinking, boy, this is going to be great. Five o'clock in the morning. Glasses started at 730. And so uh, basically uh, five o'clock in the morning, I'm cleaning his room. I'm making him coffee. I'm straightening out his bed. You know, he's meanwhile yelling at me, screaming at me. Uh, don't don't touch my stuff. Duh. And so two days in a row, that's what happened. He told me, come at five o'clock in the morning. No training. I just ended up cleaning his stuff. I bought him coffee. I bought him sugar. Yeah. And, so, and then, then the next thing after that, he says, okay, let's go. And so me and another guy, uh, we went in the middle of nowhere in the bushes. And he says, you cannot teach anybody. You cannot tell anybody about it. You cannot practice in front of anybody. But this is what you have to do. And then I will give you I will give you a test in 108 days, which was cement breaking. And right. then uh, along along with that, he said you must put this uh, external liniment, in this case, in, in on our hands because th there are other systems that something called a golden bell, where you you practice the whole body. Uh, I mean you can you can condition any part of your body, but in this case. We were only working on our hands, uh, right and left hand. Yeah. And there were a lot of theories about should you work the dominant hand more than the recessive hand, or should you do work the recessive hand more than the dominant hand? And a, a lot of things round and round and round and round, you know. And so then the final exam was to break break a, a, a brick of cement, a two inch cement uh, stone uh, brick. And uh, I had to sign an agreement, uh, uh, secrecy uh, agreement. So I broke the cement, and then I uh, I, I I never looked back. I, I spent uh, I uh, I conditioned every day. I practiced every day. I did lots of breaking demonstrations. I I went to lots of uh, tournaments. He invited me to his school. His school birthday is in October, and he would always have a huge. Uh, a demonstration breaking being one of them yeah. and uh, he he and his most senior student he and i would uh, do the uh, breaking cement uh, demonstrations for for uh, a few years and then, so from then on i started then teaching my own students conditioning and uh, put it in the curriculum wow. so if you want to advance any level of black belt not only do you do bar breaking but you do cement breaking as well yeah, with yeah. no no spacers, uh, no, you know, nothing special about the cement or or the lumber, and that's how that's how all of that started. Wow, wow! So again, another opportunity that came your way. Uh, I guess you you could have missed it quite easily. I guess if you'd never taken that opportunity, but there's been significant times where you've seized that opportunity, and and. Uh, and it's brought the results that you've got from your training and and teaching. Well, I mean, they say uh, life is uh, full of missed opportunities. <laughs> yeah. So I, I I think I got a few. I, I think I got a few of them. So I'm I'm not unhappy. Yeah. No. Fantastic, sir. So, um, so you still train to this day? Is part of your? Are you able to train still physically? Uh, I, I, I'm still, I'm still, uh, doing Taekwondo training, but I stopped, uh, I stopped conditioning and there were, there were some parallel stories. Uh, the Japanese went through the same thing too. The Okinawans went through the same thing too, where they had learned, uh, san, Sanchin Kata from, from the Chinese. It's a, it's a, it's a heavy breathing exercise where you inhale as, as, or you exhale as far as you can. And then your instructor will, will beat you 
to make sure that your stances are rigid and, and firm. Uh, unbeknownst to them, it's a horrendous strain on the heart. And so like uh, when, uh, when the Japanese or the Okinawans were volunteering, they were in fabulous shape physically, but a lot of them had uh, uh, heart issues. A lot of them died fairly early in their 50s because of heart conditions, all the strain that was put on the heart. So as far as the iron palm, um, you know, I, I had some concerns about putting the stress on the heart uh, to, to uh, make it worse, uh, if, if, if you may. And eventually I, I, I did have some heart issues and so I, I decided, uh, you know, I have uh, high blood pressure and I've got a, a leaking valve and uh, slightly yeah. enlarged aorta. So uh, I decided after I'd broken every which way, I, I decided, well, I think I may be out of call it a day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, plenty of There's plenty of videos. I don't I don't need to break anymore. No, I, so as far, as far as that that part, I mean, I'm still teaching it, but. I'm I'm physically not putting myself through that anymore. Um, I had read over the years uh, all of these different magazines about uh, uh, cement breaking, bore breaking, internal arts, external arts. So I was fortunate, to, uh, you know, to uh, hook up with him and learn because I think up until then, uh, most of the instructors were not teaching you how to break. They themselves might have been breaking, right? But I I don't seem to recall them actually sitting down with you and expa explaining to you the mechanics or or, or, or any kind of details. Yeah. Uh, on the contrary, I think I remember uh, getting injured quite quite frequently because either my technique was not correct or the material was not proper. So you know, I decided to actually learn it properly, and that's that's basically what I've done. Yeah. 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 Very much so. So, yeah, because breaking, uh, I guess when I was coming through, it was something painful. You were going to get hurt. Just get on with it. You know, your hand blows up. But then later on, I found actually there is a, there's a gentler way to do it through, you know, careful conditioning over time. To, to, uh, yeah. Well, and I think I think some of it, which is unfortunately still going on today, is that if you don't have the proper technique uh, on top of conditioning, of course, it makes the break very difficult. And I remember the days General Che, uh, in order to save lumber, it, let's say if he was traveling somewhere, uh, just by the way that you would approach the the actual break, he would stop you and either uh, not fail you, but he would either say, okay, no good, or it was good. He could okay. see just by how you set things up and, and how you... Uh, uh, positioned yourself he knew already what, that whether you understood how to do it or not to do it yeah which was a mystery to most of us because you know since nobody uh, nobody had taught me anyways i don't know about you but uh you know I, I just had to kind of watch and see well what what is he looking for exactly and then eventually you know once you, un you understand the angles and um how the tools work whether they're in a semicircle, you know, what, whatever the details might be. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the angle of approach. And then uh, once you condition and you make the tool hard, so then it, it kind of sort of looks easy, but but it isn't uh, actually. Yeah, yeah, no, very much so. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> we have students today that do measure. They get ready to break, measure up, and you can tell, like you said, it's not the right angle the, uh, and so on. And, and you, like you say, we can stop them there and then knowing that they're not going to be able to do it. So you can re-educate them. Yeah. So this was all quite new at some point. And so was it in your training and, and was it of the time where that not everything was being passed on? It was being just, you kind of picked it up as you kind of could. Is training more you're detailed. Talking, now? You're talking about breaking. Yeah. Yeah. And general training in general, is it more detailed now? Would you say than the old days? Was it more? Uh, yeah, unfortunately, uh, you, you, uh, you did as they said that, that, that was the training. There was, there was no manuals. There were no syllabus. There were no, no requirements per se, other than whatever was it 
in the head of the instructors. The same thing with the exams. You never knew when they were going to be or what was going to be in them. Yeah. So it, it was it was always a surprise and uh it was it was it was fairly confusing in and in, in, uh, in the bedlam because some of the time I remember uh being told that uh, you had to perform X pattern and the students running outside trying to learn it right right before right before the exam you know yeah yeah so yeah. It, it was it was a, it was a little it, it was a little different you know a little different yeah 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 of course but um how you teach today is quite different from when you first started then yourself well today of course it's it's uh you have uh, you have the internet there's a lot of stuff that's on video not that it's you know perfect um i think i think my my biggest beef right now is that most of the groups are not paying attention to to the stances the uh transition from one stance to another stance um you don't you don't quite get to see it and and then they're also posing the kicks which is uh i think there's a misunderstanding about the uh posing of the kicks because it was intended to to teach a beginner so at the black belt level you're not expected to be posing kicks uh as you're going through patterns in this particular case you wouldn't pose it when you're sparring so you know, you watch uh, high high grade black belts competing, and they'll throw the leg out, side piercing kick or whatever kick it might be, and it it stays out there. But yeah. then, if you if you read the fine print under defending and attacking instructions, the both interestingly, number four requires for you to withdraw uh, after every technique to get ready for the next one. So for some reason, that part, I don't know, it is still being left out. And um, uh, there's, I've, I've heard that uh, there's some issues like with the L stances. They, they, they still seem to be way, way too long compared to a fixed stance, let's say. Yeah. And, and a lot of it has to do with the, some of the pictures in the encyclopedia, I guess, to save time or money. He kind of took the same picture and posted it a uh, perfect example is a fixed stance and a no stance he's using the same exact picture but yet he has drawn some lines where the weight is supposed to be and then if you don't pay attention you look at the picture and you say well you know both those stances are the same yeah but they're, they're not the same you know you have to read uh you know the 70 30 and the 50 50 business and and like that so you know you have you you have those kinds of things, and then lately I've I've seen the sparring. I don't know what's happened to our sparring. We used to laugh at the WTF people. Oh look, they're bouncing up and down with the hands down, and a lot of hugging and kissing, and 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 so. And now we fast forward, and we're doing exactly the same thing. We're bouncing up and down with the hands down. Uh, I don't, I, I don't understand that. I have, a, I have a lot of troubles with that, you know? Yeah. 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 Why do you think that is, sir? Do you think the sport has kind of created its own version of what we are doing versus the actual martial art or? Well, I don't know. I think my, my theory is that there's a, there's still a push to be included in the Olympics. Yeah. And I think an agreement with, uh, uh, North Korea ITF and the WTF that they're going to be allowed uh, to to participate in the Olympics. So I'm assuming that um, they, they're going to have to adapt to those rules as far as sparring is concerned. And so the only way is they're going to have to be bouncing up and down like, like, like those guys. I mean, I don't know, but uh, you know, to me, I, 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 I'm not crazy about it. I, I, I totally disagree uh, with the hopping up and down kind of business and especially yeah. the hands down. I mean, if you go into open tournaments, which is when we were coming up, there were not a lot of ITF tournaments. You start bouncing up and down with the hands up, you're going to get knocked out. Right, I right. mean, a hundred percent, you're going to get knocked out. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. 
so I'm a little concerned, you know, uh, you put that habit into a student and if he's met with a real situation outside, he's going to start with the hands down. And first yeah. thing is punch in the face or kicked in the face. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. 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 So, but, uh, but uh, yeah, the, the, the stance transition is, is what I, what I, I'm, I'm usually looking at. And then the, the half facing or the full facing, uh to go along with the stances and that's um i'm uh we're, we're beginning to lose some of that as well you know yeah and of course we can't even talk about the sine wave because everybody has some interpretation as to how that is supposed to be performed yeah um so you know that part it is what it is and then of course uh grandmaster che the the son has now added screaming and yelling to the patterns on top of everything else, which uh, used to be back in the day when June Ree came out with his first set of books. Yeah. Uh, every so many pages has a star uh, and the stars signify the place where you're supposed to be uh, yelling, you know, key ups. And so, yeah. so I, I don't know, maybe that's his thinking you know, that he's going to go back to those kinds of things. And then you have uh, Grandmaster Pons in uh, Spain that he was saying that the uniforms had to be gray. Uh, and then so he was pushing the the, the, the gray uniforms. Okay. Awesome. I happen to have a blue one. <laughs> uh, so I have a polyester with the zipper in the front. I, I have a, the original uniform. And... Uh, you know, they forget that back in the day, cameras were not like how they are today. So color with a flash, depending on the material, okay. would not necessarily come out to the color that the material was. Yeah. And so when I took a picture, uh, I think you, you even see Grandmaster MacPhail also. You, it kind of looks blue, but if you, if you look at it, it looks grayish. Uh, and that was never the intent. Uh, you could. You, you, I had some conversations with Grandmaster Pons about it, and I said, find any encyclopedia from 1965 on that says uh, that the uniforms are gray. Everywhere you look, it says uniforms are white. <laughs> oh yeah. So now I think he's beginning to make you know make make a little bit of the change okay. back to what you know. I I, I don't know. Yeah. That's been my observations. Yeah, yeah. So your your blue dogot that was from what was the history from that? The, the uh, you say you had a blue one. Yeah, they're blue. They're it's like it's not polyester because yeah. polyester didn't exist then. I think they were either made in Russia. Okay, I'm not quite sure. I think uh, Russia, but it's a uh, it's a uh, blue. You know, bl blue is a very significant color in Korean culture, you know, they have the blue house and blue pottery and so on. And so I think that he was thinking that we would be wearing blue uniforms as an homage to, okay. to, to color. Yeah. But, uh, that, that never took off. But I mean, I, I have two sets of those. And like I say, Grandmaster MacPhail has one. I sent the set to, uh, Grandmaster Vitaly because he had remembered those as well. And I think he was missing either a jacket or a pant. I don't. I don't remember now. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, they were they 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 were blue back in the day. Right, right. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. And as as you say, someone took a photo. Maybe it looked a different color on the photo because of like you say the the, the technology, the the flash, uh, and it's been possibly misinterpreted going forwards as a return to something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, so you've not. Obviously, over your many years of training and, and experiences, um, you've seen the, the changes. <clears throat> Even in my years, I've seen the changes from what we first began learning to to what is widely practiced now. And some, I understand that some schools are dropping three-step sparring or two-step sparring. Uh, and, and some of the explanations are it doesn't actually uh, relate to the free sparring. But again, that draws us towards the competition side. Um, where they're not necessarily doing the, the self-defense side of it, rather than just the sport for points. Yeah, well, 
yeah when i when i first started uh we didn't have some of the some of the step sparrings either okay and basically one step uh it's just that the, their terminology was fairly different you know roundhouse kick cat stance yeah horse it's more more japanese-ish kind of sort of sort of uh uh yeah and i i, I don't know i think to, to to remove it i mean again you look at the encyclopedia and you, you see the the evolution in theory free sparring was not supposed to come up till you were a red belt no. so it would start you know three uh three alone three with a partner two one you know, semi-free model sparring, foot sparring, you know, like that. It was a somewhat of a natural evolution to get you ready for uh, free sparring. And even though some schools are taking those things out, uh, the ITF has added some kind of a, I, I, don't, I don't know what the label is, but they have some kind of a prearranged step sparring with a partner. Yes. Uh, I, I think General Che would be rolling in his grave, I, I'm, I'm thinking. You know that um, I don't know it. That they're applying uh, pattern movements to some kind of a step sparring that they have created. You know, which again, I'm I'm, I'm against those. So yeah. are they the ones that very, in the competition? Not very realistic. Not very realistic sure. uh, because at the end of the day, when you start with a beginning student, you want to make sure that they pay attention to the foundation, the stances and uh hand movements and so and here you you, you have i don't know fifth sixth in i don't know what level and you're back to that again you know where they are basically working on stances and uh hand movements and so uh it, it should be freer if it's going to be something like that rather than you know so static yeah and in my opinion anyways you know i don't know yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's a great point you make, sir, yeah, and how things do change over time. And, and as you say, maybe not always to the better. Um, I guess some people would argue that they're able to produce more competitors in this system. But like you say, as from the founder's point of view and those early instructors, maybe it's quite different. Um, so in your school, when you teach spying, sir, you're Kalmok Davy Mackey, you you. you how do you teach the sparring in your school? Is the uh, we we learn real fast, and again, uh, participating in open tournaments opens up your eyes big time. Okay. Uh, when you get to uh, sparring only just the one way, and that was the WTF uh, issue, because they would refuse a to allow us in, and or go anywhere else to fight. So they they stayed in house. Um, because there were not that many ITF tournaments when I first started, we started going into open tournaments, sparring, uh, breaking, uh, yeah. uh, it was, it was a horse of another color because you got to see the, the, the different postures, different stances, different timing, yeah. uh, movement, movements that, that look kind of alien. And, you know, eventually, uh, we didn't pay too much attention we just uh, figured out, okay, so are they Chinese, Japanese? So what is their forte? Are they more kickers or are they more, are they more like punching? Or do they have a combination of both? Do they fight in a circle? Uh, do they fight straight? Uh, things like that, which is the, the yeah. things that they're working on today. And so uh, I always worked using the theory of the circle you know, just to keep moving in a circle as much as you possibly could uh, to prevent fighting straight because 99%, if you look at sparring matches, when they when they say go, they both go in a straight line. Yeah. So if you have a mindset already, if you have a mindset already that when he says go, I'm going to step to the side or something other than backing up straight or, or something other than going straight, I have a much better chance of uh, of uh, of winning uh, at the end of the day, and so then we had the saying: uh, round beats straight, straight beats round, hands feet, uh, uh, hands beat feet, feet beat hands, okay. and so then that's that's how we worked it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
No, I like that. I like the sound of that. That's a good, good thing to remember, isn't it? Like you say, the straight fighters want to line you up, but if you're never there, you're always on the move to the side. They, they're going to find that uh, difficult, aren't they? So straight, right. away, you've got that advantage straight away from a. Because like a lot of sparrers, like you say, will come at you straight off. Particularly those rings that are quite small, you know, the smaller the ring. It's who can get the other person out, isn't it? You know. Well, and again, if if you look at the at the M, at the MMA guys, they're not hopping around with their hands down. No, 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 that's right. You know, and then uh, I we used to have different levels of sparring too, where. Uh, because again, back in the day, you you could sweep, and then either kick him or punch him on the way down, right. and punch and kick him while he was down. And so uh, I I have the three uh, several different uh, levels of sparring. Uh, uh, the for the special needs, of course, they could only come like a foot close. That's it. And again, that was a big thing way too. When you go to tournaments, uh, you would kind of kick and punch the air. Because uh, they they figured you could could not make there was no contact, yeah. And so then they then they came with the point sparring, you know, light touch, and so we would uh, com- continue to escalate, uh, sweep and throw, and then sweep and throw, and then work on the ground, so like a four or five different uh, different ways, so that you would get used to it, you know. Yeah, yeah. So that you would not get get uh, kind of sort of like an MMA ish, but yeah, not yeah. quite. Not quite as violent, you know. Right. Yeah, yeah, and no, I'm hearing that. So, like, everything you're describing is more of a kind of <clears throat> different skills against different approaches. And, uh, yeah, it, it sounds a bit like you say, like the, the modern-day MMA fights. But like you say, without the – quite as brutal, yeah. Yeah, because the student needs to see it. Because uh, if, uh, if, if they don't have the experience – hundred uh, percent of the time they just freeze and stand there yeah you see them kind of like scratching the head well I, I don't you know the guy's in some kind of a you know rear foot stance and 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 moving the fingers like a snake and the student will like well I, I don't see an opening I I don't understand the rhythm uh, uh the posture is 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 a little alien it's not the typical you know one hand up one hand down kind of thing yeah yeah so so, uh, and that's how it's going to be on the street. You know, these, these guys are coming from, from nowhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So teaching correct technique, application, vital spots, distance, timing. These are all things that are vital for self-defense, like you say, out in the street. <clears throat> yeah, well, and then we have an issue with the applications because I think I had mentioned that last time that, the way that we practice, if you think about, let's just take three-step sparring just just for a moment. Uh, we're told that we have to block, let's say, wrist to wrist or wrist to ankle. Um, if 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 you stop and think about it, it's it's fairly worthless for you to block in that fashion, because if if uh, you can block the person's wrist or ankle, he or she has already extended that tool. And it, they couldn't hit you even if even if they wanted to, nor would you even have to block it, you know. So um, that's where the free sparring, of course. Now you you are you are entering the different zones uh, to where you can actually step in and and uh, and and do some damage, you know. So the step sparring. That's why if if you start to take it out, it takes away from. Uh, changing your habits from wrist to wrist to uh, something different, you know, defending in a different way, whether dodging, evading, uh, you know, making making your defenses a little shorter, a little choppier, uh, more direct, and uh, you know, like like that. So, but I'm not seeing I'm not seeing much of that. Yeah. So yeah, we've got the sparring. That's like you say, it's, it's evolving on itself through the, the popularity of the sport. And say, like you say, moving towards a more uh, possible Olympic recognition, maybe that's the, the impetus behind that. 
Um, and that's one aspect of Taekwondo, but you can still train in schools that do, so some schools do both, like they've got the competition side and then they've got the other students that don't pursue that. And then there's more of the real kind of self-defense sparring. Well, you know, the, the in interesting observation was what, before sparring came to be, um, they give some credit to, to uh, Funakoshi and his, and his seniors. Uh, they were, Funakoshi was totally against competition um, for a lot of different reasons. And I, I think, um, I, I think I have a like mindset. Uh, I, I, I don't really care too much for competition and, and, it, and it's not especially today, but the schools have a competition team, which is, which is terrible. It, it just gives, uh, uh, I think a very bad feeling to that student who's there because he's got low esteem or low self-confidence and yet he's not picked for this special for the special team and uh, or it's about the money where they charge you extra for competition team or management team or whatever those things might be um when when we would go to tournaments it was everybody it didn't matter it didn't matter the skill didn't matter anything we didn't we, we never had a competition team you know and they they got to learn to compete against themselves and understand that it wasn't about first second and third how many people how many kids you see they they get super angry when they get second place and they they throw their gloves on the ground or their helmet or their mouth guard you know they, they they're all all upset because they 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 only came second yeah. and meanwhile Got, you got a hundred kids who didn't even, you know, uh, who who lost on the first go round. Let's say, yeah, yeah. You know, so I I think in some ways tournaments give a give a give a bad perspective as to what the arts, martial arts, are supposed to be, i.e., self growth. You know, and so like I said, I I, I would take the whole school. We'd all, all go, and uh, win lose didn't matter. Nobody cared if you got first. And everybody was happy if you got eighth or tenth, yeah. right? Yeah. So that's that's a scoop on uh, on tournaments, and and now even more so, uh, everybody everybody has a world championship. I have no clue who's behind those, which which group with ITF, which ITF. I mean, how many world championships can you have? For goodness sakes, you know, um, they should all get together and, and uh, make a decision, split the money whichever way, and have one true world championship amongst all comers. Doesn't matter. You know, if you just want to do just the Chung Hun system, so open it up to uh, old Chung Hun, and, and then you then you have a real world championship. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So you, you make some great points. Um, I really like the thing about taking all your students to a competition and win, lose, or draw. We're all the same. We're on the same path, you know, and uh, like you say, <clears throat> making a big deal about winning, it can be, uh, it can, it can appeal to a part of the nature of a person that we're not trying to cultivate as much as, uh, as, as the, you know, the tenants teach us, you know, you're trying to uh, help people to see beyond winning as a great thing and losing as a bad thing. Right. Well, again, I mean, if you look at, if you look at all the, uh, uh, guidelines that we have, the student oath, the tenets, uh, courtesy, integrity, perseverance, self-control, and dominable spirit. And then the student oath, in there about you got to be the best fighter. Yeah. It's all about you being a better human being, <laughs> you yeah. know? Yeah, yeah. And and, and we lose that with the change. <clears throat> yes, sir, that's right. I understand that. Yeah, we, we're trying to be you know, in our own schools, we try and be uh, mindful of that, that uh, the, co the competition does raise awareness and, and uh, uh, excitement. But like you say, you have to temper it with what we're actually trying to do here. Um, so, yeah, you make some great points there, sir. Um, I mean, it does. Uh, don't get me wrong. It, 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 it has its place. <clears throat> but it, that it's, it's more of a focus now than, than, than it used to be. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, 100%. And uh, 
And like you said, there are many world championships now, and it, it, it is such a shame. I've spoken to many other grandmasters. They all wish for one. Um, nobody quite knows, I think, quite how to pull it off or how to go about it. Um, but that would be the wish and desire, I guess, of a lot, a lot of seniors and, and masters as well. As well, there's a, there's a little bit of that going on in a quiet sort of way, uh, I believe. Uh, we have the U.S. Open here in, in, the, in, in the U.S., in, in Orlando. They just had it not long ago. And they had, a, they had an ITF division, and it was open to everybody. Okay. So, so uh, it, it, it's possible to do, but it seems like it's got to be in, on some kind of neutral ground. Uh, either through some kind of open tournament and then you become part of that open tournament. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know. It, it's a shame that the egos of the, of the big three or however many, uh, you know, I, I don't understand what they're afraid of. You know, if, if, if uh, you are from another group and, and, and you best me, then, you know, good for you. Yeah. Uh, why, why did you best me? Well, your stances were better or your power was better or your fighting was better uh, like that. Um, so, but I, I don't know. They're, they're all afraid that uh, they're all going to steal from each other and uh, uh, the students are going to go from one to another uh, group or another. And so I think it's sad that they even have to put it in writing. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, when you started, was there the tenants, were they, were they, at the forefront of training or there's something came in later the oath was that always at the beginning for you the uh the, the formats were completely different right uh, you know under, understanding that uh, general Che promoted athletes to high ranks to be able to promote the art and that was his main uh emphasis uh, he put them out like coffee because he wanted to get taekwondo, the you know taekwondo out there, and I think that he expected that they would either remain with him, or at least continue their training. Uh, not none of which happened, of course. Right, right. So, so uh, when when um, uh, when they when they went out, they taught what they were taught, and there, it was basically fundamental, rudimentary movements despite the fact that they were seven tens or fifth tens but i think that the general expected that he would take a first or second dance promote him to five six seven dance send him out but yet he would continue his advanced training yeah. and so when, when you looked across the board the quality was basically color belt level uh in in every way so there was a lot of a lot of stuff was missing, on top of which they never admitted to the fact that there was a book out, because then that that meant that they would be responsible for the information that was in there. Yeah. Um, and most of them hadn't been taught most of what was in there, because General Che was kind of in a hurry, you know, just to do other things. Yeah. <clears throat> I know that when I came along and I saw the book, I saw a ton of stuff that. I, I never heard of before, but then it pushed me to uh, fill in whatever those things that, uh, that that were missing. And again, even to this day, uh, we we are missing some some of the fine print that's 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 written in there. Uh, one of the things, like one of the questions, I don't know if you've ever thought about it, but our art is basically a percussion art, meaning a uh, person throws a punch and then you do a hard block. Or the person throws a kick and you do some kind of a hard kick. Yet our patterns are full of uh, sweeping, throwing pressure points, joints attacks and like that. But we haven't quite been able to get to uh, pass that part of the information along. You know, it's always against uh, one opponent. And again, it's wrist to wrist. And you, you don't see very, uh, you don't see a lot of sweeping, a lot of throwing. But if you pay attention to the other arts or our or our ant, our uh, uh, predescendants arts, whatever those yeah. whatever those are, 
if we look at how they were teaching, they were a complete art, like MMA, ground and pound, yeah. uh, sweeping point, pressure points, joint attacks. And so interestingly enough, our intermediate hand positions lend themselves to all those things, sweeping, throwing, pressure points, joint attacks. But we have to be able to be guided to be able to then uh, reintroduce these things that used to be in there. Funakoshi certainly knew them. His instructors absolutely knew them. Yeah. But in order for, for Funakoshi to make it public around nine, 1905, <laughs> eye gouging and throat ripping and all of the nasty stuff so that they could teach it to the intermediate uh, schools, yeah. uh, regular schools. And so then when we came along, one of the accusations that I heard when, when I was coming up is that you guys are masters of nothing. Uh, you, your, your, your art is uh, immature. Your art is incomplete. You're, you're only working only just a very superficial part of it. The, you, you're not working on the ground and pound, and you're not understanding why are you crossing the hand the one way uh, wh what is the 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 non-active hand doing? Uh, yeah. These rotations, 180 or or uh, 90 degree rotations, the slipping and sliding as well. So you guys are not understanding that these are uh, attacks with the shins. So they're displacing with the legs. I mean, there's just a whole bunch of stuff there that had always bothered me from you know from from my particular art so you know i've spent a few years now looking and then contact contacting some of the older systems ishin ryu um some of the shorokan guys uh, i went to harry cook's house uh, i think i know who you, uh, you know who harry cook is I'm not harry, cook, I'm harry not. cook lives in leeds or he used to live Thank in you. leeds yeah he wrote the definitive book on Shotokan. You know, I went to talk to him to see if I could get some clarity as to did Shotokan have sweeping throwing because um, I've compared quite a few postures and I'm talking about uh, not normal postures between the way Funakoshi does them in his books and the way, the way we do them today. Let's say bending ready stance, say, I mean, just things that are just uh, n not normal. They all they all absolutely they come uh, you know out of Shotokan. So um, I've been now in touch again with some of the other Shotokan guys to see if we can get some direction that we can go in to where they tell us you know when you cross the hands you are doing this and this and this and this and if you watch the uh, jujitsu guys and they're on the ground, and they're trying to choke somebody out, they absolutely use a nine-shape uh, uh, nine uh, choke, choke hold. And so there's a whole bunch of things in our movements that absolutely have something to do with something different other than just percussion. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, so, so your findings are that where the patterns began and developed from, originally these moves were something quite different to what we we understand today or is a lot being left out is that what you're telling us a lot of the applications the original applications are left out from our teaching we don't yeah the applications were left out a lot of them um do you think there's a reason most that is, or... most of the time you're just told do it this way because yeah you know why does the hand go on top or why do you bend the elbows or how come you're crossing in front of your chest? And then, you know, uh, like a knife hand checking block, you take a look at the judo jujitsu guys, they've got their hands inside of the guy's jacket with right. that, uh, with that X hand. And, you know, they're choking somebody out with one of those. Yeah, and yeah. so those, those kinds of things, um, uh, we have very few, if any, in our, you know, in our books. But if you look at other arts, older arts, traditional arts, you see that same exact move, uh, whether it's uh, twin blocks, it doesn't matter. You look at the same exact block 
or attack. And you see that uh, there's a different use for it altogether than what we were taught. Uh, and they talk also, you don't hear it, but it is, it is written in our encyclopedia that a block is a strike and a strike is a block. Yeah, yeah. In the Okinawa, that's very, that's very Japanese, you know, but yet it is written in our, in our encyclopedia as well. Yeah. So, you know, we need to apply blocks as attacks as well as the other things that are not included. Yeah, yeah. So, so you, so part of your um, observations is to raise awareness about this and for people to find out and you practice them in their training. So not just against the imaginary opponent, start trying these things out on each other. We already do that with our one step and, and, uh, and free sparring and elements, but there's actual self-defense grappling applications that are there that we're not using or, or we don't know. Exactly. Well, that there's that saying, you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. And then, but again, when you, when you see it, if you pay attention, uh, other, other styles, you, you'll see that that same exact move they're using, utilizing that same exact move in a different sort of way. You know, whether it's the Aikido guys, the Jiu Jitsu guys, um, and again, but since we haven't, our eyes are not quite open. We we just kind of like uh, walk by it, really. Yeah. But it, it's it's bothered me that we cannot just only be a percussion art. Uh, they were never meant to be. The fact that General Che took the components from Shotokan, well, you know that's something else altogether. But he's expecting us to continue to evolve the art. You know, without making drastic changes. Uh, I don't think that he minds that we are adding to it, whatever these things might be. Um, um, so that's that's my perspective. I think that we need lots of work on, on the, interpreting the intermediate hand positions. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So yeah, that's a great point again. And uh, I'm sure people listening will, will be uh, mulling that over themselves um whatever level they may be at and maybe some people know a bit more about that um we've spoken about other senior grandmasters and high level uh koreans that you've managed to meet and train with uh have we mentioned june ri you did mention him earlier uh is that someone you met and trained with or had much to do uh, with? uh i i never met him i i met his students because at one time, of course, he he was part of our system, and uh, his claim to fame was that it seems uh, Muhammad Ali either hired him uh, for. Uh, they're claiming that his back fist, Muhammad Ali's back fist, came from Jumri. Okay. And there's another claim that uh, Bruce Lee worked with him uh, on the kicking part because uh, Wing Chun kicks were were, were, were different, yeah. not, not, not a la Taekwondo, you know. But um, I, I, I met his students over schools here, and uh, at, uh, they used to come and they, they would train with me the, in, during the days when they were still, <clears throat> still working the Chung Hoon patterns. Once he went into musical forms, and then they they dumped all of the Chung Hoon stu stuff. That that was the end of that, you know. Right. Yeah, yeah. But he, like you say, he got quite a lot of notoriety meeting the famous people and working with them. Um, so yeah, he he obviously had a relationship with General Che from the beginning. But uh, I wasn't sure how it was as it developed. Whether they had a good uh, relationship thereafter but he certainly moved to taekwondo around the us quite well did he was he at the beginning of that well remember that he wasn't he wasn't alone there were there were there were quite a few other uh korean instructors that were going around and and promoting their version of uh, i mean they would call it taekwondo today but uh, there's some groups that have surfaced uh Chang Mukwan is one, Chin Mukwan is another one. Uh, 
And uh, the Murukwan Tang Soo Do guys are still around. Uh, Chongdokwan uh, guys are still around. So, you know, they're still promoting the Japanese or the Chinese way, despite the fact that they call themselves uh, a, a Korean martial arts. So there were uh, quite a few pioneers as far as those arts, uh, most of them, and 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 they were they were having concurrently uh, instructor courses and uh, uh, competition and 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 students everywhere. Uh, most of us were oblivious to to quite a bit of that, yet that was still going on. And today, more and more, they're surfacing and saying, "Oh yeah, in the fifties and in the." Uh, during the ITF era or or um, Chung Do Kwan era, you know our system, our founder was also around, and so there's there's quite a bit of history still with with other arts that are uh, resurfacing today that were in parallel. It just so happens that General Che uh, was able to promote it in a much bigger way. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, so uh, <clears throat> you spent quite a bit of time with uh, Senior Grandmaster Chuck Sheriff. We spoke at the beginning how you met. Uh, did, did that continue for some time? Yep. Um, most of us, and again, the way that the ITF was set up, there was only one national governing body per country. Uh, that was the theory. Uh, Argentina, of course, was an exception. And I think maybe Australia, New Zealand might have been an exception too. I, I don't remember now, but uh, U.S. there was there was only one national governing body, and so then when I was looking for a home, they uh, General Che's daughter funneled me to uh, Grand Master Serif as the official voice for the ITF. Um, eventually. Uh, uh, I think it was Grandmaster Quan J. Hua. No. There was another Grandmaster made a big stink that uh, he couldn't belong into the USTF. And so uh, the Katu, the head of the Korea America Taekwondo Union, and his name escapes me now. But um, they, so at the time, there were, there were two ITF representatives. Uh, it just so happens that um, I was with Grandmaster Sarah from about 1985 till 1999. Well, yeah. And then I, I split from there. And um, we had a long talk with General Che. And uh, he that's when things started to open up to where uh, seniors, other seniors could then go directly to the ITF and get certification and, and, and so on without having to go through one main national governing body so uh, a bunch of many governing bodies popped up and uh, they answered directly to the ITF and um, that's that's how that's how it kind of split yeah 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 of course and uh, and and so that was a uh, quite a big time for you wasn't it I mean what would you say out of your whole Taekwondo career has been your greatest time greatest moments can you share any of those? It's been it's been a it's been a great ride from the start, to be honest. Uh, being on a cover of Taekwondo Times magazine in two thousand one, I thought that was I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. And ITF was in a major turmoil at the time, so so uh, that was like the beginning of the splits, where and, and General Che passed away. I saw him uh, November two thousand one. He was already sick, <clears throat> and then he died uh, June of 2002. So I, I didn't go to Denver for his last. I would have gone, but I I, I had uh, I was no longer part of the USTF, so <clears throat> I wasn't able to see him for the last time. And to be honest, I'm kind of glad I didn't, because the last time I saw him, you know, he was walking around. He was relatively fine. Yeah, I, I think heartbreaking to see him in a wheelchair with oxygen uh you know i don't and again it was really controversial a lot of people were fairly bent out of shape as to why are we pushing this old man who's sick 
to come out and 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 be part of uh, instruct the course. And I mean, it, it. Some people were not happy about it, but right. it is what it is. He made the choice. Yeah. You know, no, nobody, nobody told no to General Che. So, you know, that's that's how that came to be. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I do remember that. And like you say, it was quite a shock to see see him like that. Um, but as you say, it was his last seminar. So I guess a lot of people were able to uh, spend time with him, you know, in his, in his last, last uh, seminar. Um, so you mentioned you were, you were on the front of the Taekwondo time. Brilliant picture. I mean, was that easy to set up and do? Was that or? Um, from, from a photography standpoint, it was, it was fairly challenging. Yeah. I had uh, a professional photographer. I went into his studio and uh, he had so many lights because he wanted to make sure that he could capture all of it. And I had told him, I basically have two breaks in, in, in my arsenal. Yeah. Uh, beyond that, I'm going to have to rest and take it easy because um at the end of the day, it was it was a lot of cement. It was you know it was a lot of stress on the heart, and of course it was a uh, you know the, I mean it's hard. And so I told him, listen, I would prefer if you could get it in one shot. I would be very appreciative. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, you know I set up the cement and he got it in one sh in one shot. So I was I was fairly happy. Yeah, the yeah. one for the cover, one for the cover as well. Uh, the break breaking eight. Uh, roofing tiles as a matter of fact i did a cement breaking demonstration from for uh grandmaster nam tehi and um we were driving uh to lunch and so uh he was he was telling me about uh the break that he did in 1953 or so and so uh the magazine had just come out and he said so how, how many cements do you have and i said well there's there's eight there. And he said, uh, I, I, I did 13. And I said, yes, sir. <laughs> you did, you know. So uh, there was a there was a little bit of a give a give and a take, you know, with the breaking. So, uh, you know, all, all those guys, they 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 knew how to break. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like you say, you mentioned again, Nam Tehi, I mean, legendary person. Uh, in Taekwondo, uh, and you got to spend some close time with him. I mean, would, would that be up there in your greatest times in Taekwondo? Would you say spending time with someone like that? Well, as I as I was saying, that the, the whole journey, um, I don't really have the one one great thing. It was all great because uh, every every time. Uh, there would be some event, some something, you know, cool would happen, whatever that might be. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, I, I don't really have the one favorite. I made uh, lots of friends and uh, uh, like-minded people, uh, very bright people. Um, I was, I was, and I still am in absolute awe when I look at the encyclopedia, and uh, I try to put myself in General Che's mindset. And all the ones that came that helped him as well, because he was not he was not alone. It, it's it's just such a wonder. Uh, and then I, I I challenged the student. Okay, put a pattern together with twenty or thirty moves, something yeah. different makes sense, you know. Yeah. And I mean they they're all pulling their hair out, and here we have 25, 26 patterns, you know, thousand eighty moves. It's just it's just mind boggling. And then the, the details, when you start to read, while forming, while executing, slipping, sh uh, shifting, sliding. I mean, just, just, it's just, it's just wonderful. Just, you know, so I'm, I'm still in awe, just that alone, uh, the volume of work and thinking and practicing and, and to come up with something different, not, not something that, oh yeah, well, that's just a copy of something else when when you know it stands on its own yeah yeah no absolutely so you 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 know you're able to argue certain points and and and, and uh articulate them very well 
about what you're learning. But at the end of the day, you're still in awe of the whole experience, General Che, formation of the patterns. But, uh, but and you mentioned General Che and you came up with a few questions for him. But I guess he had the same kind of mind, the inquisitive, challenging, questioning mind as well, would you say? Uh, he, he, he had to have had. Yeah. Because again, to, to despite the fact that he, he had, uh, I, I don't call it help, but you know, he he had a, he had a guide uh, with the Shotokan books that Funakoshi had written, plus him having trained in, in Shotokan as well. He had some idea, perspective of movement and force and, uh, you know, whatever. So, you know, he had to be a very bright guy and to be a two-star general at 33 years old, you know, he, and being, being a little guy, uh, he, he had to have a lot on the ball about everything, yeah, yeah. you know. Yeah, okay, some people didn't like him. Well, that's, that, that's how it goes. Yeah. But again, when it's all said and done, just look at the encyclopedias and, and just flip through them. As a matter of fact, if you flip through the big pictures in the encyclopedia, uh, he designed the encyclopedia in such a way that when you flip the pages, uh, the pattern relief uh, 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 comes to life like a kinescope. And so when as you're fl flipping the pages, you see, you'll see, you'll, for example, Chanji, you'll see him move uh, page by page by page by page by page, and you get to see the whole pattern as in a movie, you know, I, in my mind, it, oh my God, this is, it, this is great, you know, to be able to see the actual pattern moving, yeah. you know. So there's a lot of stuff in there that still yet to be discovered, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking. Yeah, yeah. And I'm, I'm, next year will be 55 years that I'm looking in there, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm still in wonder, so hopefully you guys will continue uh, the work and and uh, try not to water it down and try not to make the stupid changes that they're talking about. Yeah, thank you, sir. I was going to just ask you for any advice going forwards for the next generation, and like you say, you, you made some points there already. Um, how about? just for the you know the average student that's maybe listening in i know a lot of my students listen to these podcasts um uh, and so do very many senior people um but is there a couple of things you could say to just the average student that's that's tapping into you know to something they're finding a lot about what you're saying about general che and and so on well the stance is uh the stance is super critical and uh from the very beginning um, and again, we weren't taught that way at the start. We were taught in a general sort of way. And then at red, they, f they would go back and attempt to fix uh, all of the bad habits. And um, when I opened up my school, I thought that that was way too much work and kind of a, not the right way. So from the very start, I started beating into them how the, 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 the proper stances and, and the timing and the breathing you know, hot eyes, feet, hands, uh, breathing. I mean, just beat it into them. Yeah, okay, so maybe it's not entertaining and maybe it's drudgery and maybe it's lots of work and maybe it's not as much fun, but you can make it fun. I mean, you can find ways to do it in such a way, but yet still harass them. You know, walking stands one and a half toe to toe, uh, shoulder wide from the center of the feet. And... Um, uh, on and on and on and on, you know, same thing with the L stances, 15 degrees in. And uh, if you don't teach it to them, the foundation, they end up with messed up knees or messed up hips yeah. or the tech don't quite work out uh, as, as how they should. And so you'd be surprised, you know, because sometimes instructors are afraid that, oh, I'm going to lose this student because it's, uh, you know, we're not jumping, flying 360s. Uh, we're not breaking boards. Uh, uh, it's a martial art, you know. It's a military art, and uh, with without proper foundation, 
uh, if you you have nothing. I see seniors, their stances are terrible. They they don't they they're not understanding. You know that how how it's supposed to be. Fifteen degrees in or twenty five or whatever those things might be. So that's one of the first things I look to see that they transition from a walking stance to L stance or L to walking. Make sure the feet are how they're supposed to be. Uh, make sure they don't pose the kicks, for example. For a beginning student, yeah, they can pose the kicks. But even they, I force them to withdraw uh, every time. Because if they're going to get into a fight in school, you don't want them throwing a front snap kick and then they pose the kick <clears throat> or a turning kick and then they're posing the kick. Next thing you know, the kid's on the ground and you yeah, lost the fight. So that would be that would be my advice. <laughs> work on the fundamentals. Work on the fundamentals. Yeah, no, that's brilliant because um, I found if you help the student to dive deeper into the actual whole experience, the technical side, the the thinking, the the knowledge behind it, you give them an opportunity to to learn something that means much more to them than just this foot in front and so on, and then move on to something different and. If you give them a chance to, to experience the subject matter in a deep way, I think they identify with it and they, they want to know more. Yeah. Do you do you uh, do you give written exams? Uh, we don't. We do in the uh, final black belt test, but um, up until that stage, it's oral from our book. You know the history and the terminology, and at each level, they have to recite or tell us answers to questions. Okay, yeah, because I, I, I set it up to uh, every belt has their own written exam, right. and it's a kind of technical questions and history as well. And uh, even when I teach instructor courses, there's a written there's a written hundred hundred question exam at the end, uh, because it's not the same sitting there for three four days sleeping, and then they give you a piece of paper, and then then now you're a, you're an instructor now. You know, yeah. but when when I came along, I said, uh, just make sure you you take notes because you have a hundred uh, hundred question exam, and you you got to pass with an eighty, and uh, you have some extra credits, some uh, hidden questions about General Che and about a bunch of different things. So I think it uh, not only verbally should you be giving an exam. Because sometimes they they will call you up and they would ask you something, you know. But uh, I got used to not only doing that, but also giving them a written exam, thesis, community service, um, teaching hours in the case of black belts, so that they they get the the full scope of uh, how to be uh, you know well rounded. But absolutely, with a written test, it reinforces everything that you've been telling them all along. You yeah, know yeah. how why, how long, because they have to they have to spit it back out to you, and they they learn it even more so than only than only just receiving a spoon be, being spoon fed. You know. Yeah, yeah. No, I get that, sir. Yeah. So, um, well, it's been uh, it's been really enjoyable speaking to you, sir. I've thoroughly enjoyed my time, and uh, I've, I've learned a lot already. And I'm sure the people listening and watching. We feel exactly the same way. Um, you've certainly got a lot to share, sir, with your experience and your knowledge and understanding and your inquisitive to, to what, what is technique and what isn't and so on. So I've really enjoyed, appreciated it. I enjoyed it thoroughly. Well, I, I enjoyed it as well. Thank you very much for reaching out. And uh... Okay, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Happy very holidays. Yes, sir. Thank you. Bye.